guests, and I'm delighted to welcome you all to this event. I'd like to begin it with a story. The first time I ever saw a computer, I was seven years old. My father took me to a science museum in North Carolina to see a Commodore computer, if you remember those. And then I took a class to learn how to program one of the most important inventions in the history of mankind to design a smiley face, which then printed out on one of those spool printers that you tore the perforated uh, paper from the side of it. Three decades later, the centrality of computers to our lives is almost impossible to comprehend. Indeed, we're so surrounded by computers that we don't even think of them as computers anymore. We're woken by computerized clocks. We take showers in uh, water that's regulated by a computer. We drink coffee made in a computer, eat oatmeal that's been heated up in a computer, drive to work in a car that has hundreds of computers in it while we sneakily check the news on a phone that is really a computer. And then at work, we spend much of our day pushing buttons on a computer, an experience that was once so futuristic that it was the job that George Jetson had. Remember, he was a digital index operator, which was this crazy concept back in the 1960s that you work behind a computer. But what's truly important is that these machines are not just omnipresent, they're now connected. Computers once stood alone, literally linked to nothing else than the electrical socket and maybe that printer. Just a generation ago, the concept of cyberspace was a word that the writer William Gibson made up for a science fiction novel that he was writing, mashing together the words cybernetics and space to describe his concept of a, quote, graphic representation of data abstracted from the banks of every computer in the human system, lines of light ranged in the non-space of the mind, clusters and constellations of data. Today, this non-space of the mind is real and it's connected at network speed. The first electronic mail, email, was sent in 1971. Today, over 40 trillion email are sent every year. The first website was made in 1991. Today, there are over 30 trillion individual web pages. Moreover, the internet is no longer just about sending mail or compiling information. It's integral to everything from the operation of our electrical plants to the tracking of purchases of Barbie dolls to our topic of today, the core functions of the US military and its role in national security. This realm of communication and connection has allowed globally networked military operations, which in turn has led to immense military reliance on this, with well over 98% of US government communications going over privately owned networks. And in turn, it's meant that it's a growing space for both contestation and even conflict. And so much as how science fiction technologies of a century ago, like the submarine or the flying machine, allowed us to access new domains and then led to fundamental questions in everything from international law to military doctrine, so has the emergence of cyberspace posed deep questions in everything from policy to law to ethics and doctrine. And of course, just like the rise of new forces back then, like the undersea warfare community, or the Army Air Corps turned into the Air Force, this new technology has led to the formation of new military forces around the globe, like the US Cyber Command or the Chinese Information Security Base, new military units whose very role is to fight and win wars in cyberspace. And different from back then, they're also being joined by a host of non-state actors. It's an exciting time. It's a fundamentally important time which is why a new focus on the questions of cybersecurity and how they connect to our other interest areas of defense policy, of arms control, of the intelligence community is what led us to form the center here at Brookings, the Center for 21st Century Security Intelligence. We hope to explore how these issues cross with each other, but also learn lessons from the connections between these fields. Now, as part of the launch for this new center, we've been conducting our own research on these questions, but also hosting an inaugural series of discussions with some of the top leaders in the field. And thus, it could not be more appropriate than to host our speaker today for this discussion on the challenges of defending the nation in a time when both the threats and the opportunities move at network speed. General Martin Dempsey is a 1974 graduate of the US Military Academy. He also holds master's degrees from West Point and Duke. His career in the nation's service has taken him around the world during both war and peacetime, from places that range from Germany to Iraq, from platoon leader to chief of staff of the army. 
In 2011, he became the 18th chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, where he currently serves as the nation's highest ranking military officer and principal military advisor to the President, Secretary of Defense, and the National Security Council. General, we're especially honored and delighted for you to join us today. Thank you, Peter. It's, it is uh, very pleased to be here. The, the attendance, I think, is indicative of the importance of the topic that we'll have the chance to discuss today. Uh, since we're comparing first impressions, I'll tell you that I, my first impression of communications was a black rotary dial phone in Bayonne, New Jersey on 3rd Street. I can remember my first phone number, Federal 96712. And, uh, uh, actually, my sister still has it. She lives down in Woodbridge, and it looks now like a, something out of a museum, doesn't it? But uh, when I asked my staff about the fellows, and I've been here before, and I'm delighted to be invited back, but when I asked about the uh, fellows here, I, they reminded me that you have experts on many things, drones, private security contractors. One of the people who discovered Stuxnet, the editor of the most controversial national security blog, and our former commander in Afghanistan, of course, General Retired John Allen. I, I felt as though listening to that particular universe of thought that I probably should wear body armor as I came here in preparation for the question and answer period. I will say before we get too far along, Peter, that I know I'm, inevitably I'm sure you'll ask me something about drones. I just ask you to remember that you write about them, but I actually have them. <laughs> Seriously. Yeah, no, we won't go there. Uh, seriously, we, uh, m me and my team that accompanied me here today are delighted to have a chance to engage with those scholars who are taking time to look to our future, especially as the defense community begins to focus inward on the implications of changing resources and this thing called sequestration. I think it's important that we force ourselves to continue to look outward at the changing world around us. One person who always looked outward was a man by the name of Douglas Engelbart. After serving as a radar technician in World War II, Engelbart, Engelbart became an engineer at Stanford. Those days were heady times in computer science. 46 years ago this week, he submitted a patent application, and the patent application was titled The XY Position Indicator for a Display System. He later nicknamed it a mouse. Engelbart's research was funded by DARPA's predecessor. His lab at Stanford was one of the original nodes of the Internet. And the mouse he invented with taxpayer funds was later licensed to Apple for a meager $40,000. The revolution in computing technology that Engelbart helped has transformed our world. More than a billion mice are in use today. Three billion people have access to the web. By this time next year, Peter mentioned all the different ways that we find computer technology around us. By this time next year, I'm quite certain that my toaster will be connected to the Internet and probably tweeting. I can actually anticipate the hashtag even now, burn toast at quarter six. But the spread of digital technology has not been without consequence. It has also introduced new dangers to our security and our safety. Since becoming chairman two years ago nearly, I have been focused on what this revolution means for our military. I visited Silicon Valley, sat with security teams of major tech companies, and spent time with an internet service provider. I sought out tech experts and even met with a venture capitalist. One thing is clear, cyber has escalated from an issue of moderate concern to one of the most serious threats to our national security. We now live in a world of weaponized bits and bytes where an entire country can be disrupted by a click of Engelbart's mouse. There are new missions we must take on as a military and steps we must take as a nation to defend ourselves from this threat. So let me talk briefly about the cyber threat. Cyber incidents have steadily increased over the past year. U.S. banks have been hit with sophisticated denial of service attacks. Last August, in the first large-scale destructive cyber attack, the Shamoon virus wiped clean the hard drives of 30,000 computers at the Saudi Arabian state oil company, Saudi Aramco. Over 20 nations now have military units dedicated to employing cyber 
in war. And toxic malware continues to proliferate among militaries, but also among hackers alike. This is the new normal in cyberspace. Disruptive and destructive cyber attacks are becoming a part of conflict between states, within states, and among non-state actors. Even if a state adversary doesn't engage in cyber conflict, global hacktivists might, may do so on its behalf. The borderless nature of cyberspace means anyone, anywhere, anywhere in the world, can use cyber to affect someone else. Strengthening our cyber defenses on military systems is critically important, but it's not enough in order to defend the nation. In cyber conflict, civilian infrastructure and businesses are often targeted first. Since I became chairman, intrusions into our critical infrastructure have increased 17-fold. The computer-controlled systems that operate our chemical, electrical, water, and transport sectors have all been probed. Several intruders have successfully gained system access. The gap between cyber defenses employed across critical infrastructure and offensive tools we now know exist presents a significant vulnerability for our nation. Secretary of Defense Chuck Hagel has called cyber an insidious and dangerous threat, and many of you remember that former Secretary of Defense Leon Panetta noted that we're at a pre-9-11 moment in which attackers are plotting, but our nation remains inadequately prepared. Today, I add my voice again to the chorus of concern. So let me talk about defending against that threat. In response to the threat, the department is growing our capacity to protect our networks. But we're also taking on a new mission. When asked, and with interagency partners, that is, defending the nation from cyber attacks. To do this, we're integrating the cyber mission across the force and we're adding personnel to United States Cyber Command. Over the next four years, 4,000 cyber operators will join the ranks. We're also investing $23 billion in cybersecurity. And we're doing all of this not to address run-of-the-mill cyber intrusions, but to stop potential attacks of significant consequence those that could threaten life, limb, and the country's core critical infrastructure. At Cyber Command, three kinds of teams will operate around the clock. National mission teams will counter adversary cyber attacks on our country. A second and larger set of teams will support our combatant commanders as they execute our military missions around the globe. And the largest set of teams will operate and defend the networks that support our military operations worldwide. These three teams constitute the cyber force that will defend our networks, defend military forces, and be prepared, if asked, to defend the nation. Our most immediate priority is keeping the .mil domain secure. But in, in the event of a domestic cyber crisis, our cyber forces will work in support of the Department of Homeland Security, and the FBI, who lead our nation's response in the .gov and the .com domains. To ensure this force is able to operate at network speed, rather than what is often called swivel chair speed, we now have a playbook for cyber. The President signed a directive that codifies how each part of the government will respond in the event of a serious cyber attack. Under this directive, the Department of Defense has developed emergency procedures to guide our response to imminent significant cyber threats. We're updating our rules of engagement, the first update for cyber in seven years, by the way, and we're improving command and control of our cyber forces. We have more work to do, but these important steps significantly strengthen our ability to defend the nation at network speed. So let me talk a bit about cyber as in, that was the the threat of cyber in our response. Let me talk for a moment, though, as well, about cyber as an asymmetric advantage. While cyber may be our nation's greatest vulnerability, it also presents our military with a tremendous asymmetric advantage. The military that maintains the most agile and resilient networks will be the most effective in future war. This is the kind of force we're building for the future, a force that I've described as Joint Force 2020. Each service is doing its part. Cyber is, threatening, is strengthening the Air Force's ability to achieve global reach. The Army is preparing to fight on a battlefield that is as much defined by cyberspace as it is enabled by it. The Navy is putting its entire workforce 
through a cyber immersion program, and the Marine Corps is smartly integrating cyber across the Corps. Collectively, the services are making the investments necessary to ensure that the Joint Force can operate in cyberspace as it operates in the land, sea, air, and space domains. This includes recruiting the right people for our cyber workforce, establishing common standards across the Joint Force, and achieving a higher degree of coordination in how we invest and how we manage our critical cyber resources. The next step is making our networks joint. Today, the Department of Defense operates 15,000 networks. We're consolidating this sprawling mass of IT into a common set of enterprise services, all based in the cloud. The new joint information environment, as we call it, will deepen collaboration across the services and mission areas. It will also be more secure, helping ensure that the integrity of our battle systems prevail in the face of disruption. As part of this new joint information environment, we're building a secure 4G wireless network that will get iPads, iPhones, and Android devices online in 2014. In fact, I have here today with me a secure mobile phone and data processor uh, that allows me to operate in the SIPR environment, both phone and data, uh, no matter where I am. Now, it's not where we need to be, where it needs to be yet, but it's an incredible first step and has the potential to revolutionize command and control. This phone, by the way, I think would make even Batman or James Bond a bit jealous, and I did have to keep an eye on Peter as he stood up here glancing at it enviously. <laughs> With tools like this, the smartphone generation joining our military will help us pioneer a new era of mobile command and control. This revolution will empower our greatest resource, that is the ingenuity of our people, and the philosophy of mission command that we all embrace. To help unleash the potential for user-driven innovation, a federated app store will allow any DOD user to write and share phone and tablet applications. By using off-the-shelf technology, we're bringing the full force of the technology revolution into the classified environment. So what's an important next step? Let me talk about cyber legislation and diplomacy. Although we've made significant progress embracing cyber within the military, our nation's effort to protect our critical civilian infrastructure is lagging. Too few companies have invested adequately in cybersecurity. I worry that adversaries will seek to exploit that chink in our nation's armor. To them, our economy and our infrastructure are the softer targets than our military. One of the most important ways we can strengthen cybersecurity across the private sector is simply by sharing information. Right now, threat information runs primarily in one direction, from the government into the operators of critical infrastructure. Very little information flows back to the government. That has to change. We can't stop an attack unless we can see it. I'm confident that indicators of an impending attack could be shared in a way that preserves the privacy, the anonymity, and the civil liberties of network users. I understand that the country is debating the proper person, purpose, limits, and of intelligence collection for national security. But let me be clear, these are two entirely different issues. One is collecting the intelligence necessary to locate foreign terrorists and their domestic, their potential domestic co-conspirators. The other is sharing information about malware to protect our critical infrastructure from a different kind of attack. We can't allow these separate debates to become conflated. The reality is that every day, adversaries are injecting malware into our networks. The worst of this malware is equivalent to cyber bullets and bombs. We must share what it looks like so that we can stop it before it detonates. Ultimately, it will take legislation to significantly strengthen our ability to withstand cyber attacks while safeguarding civil liberties. Information sharing is just one way to be safer, Improving cyber standards is another. Still a third is to work with other nations to set norms of responsible behavior in cyberspace. One of our most important dialogues on that topic, on cyber, is with China. During my visit there last month, I reinforced the need for us to address cyber in the working group that Secretary Curry proposed. We're poised to begin that process and hopefully to make some progress in meetings that begin next month. Avoiding miscalculation in cyberspace is another important goal. 
Our agreement to open a cybersecurity link with Russia is a step in the right direction, a step that we should eventually take with others. In conclusion, as you see, we have our work cut out for us as a military, as a government, and as a nation, and as an international community. The rise of cyber is the most striking development in the post-9-11 security environment. Not only are military systems being targeted by tools that can cause physical destruction, but adversaries can increasingly hold our nation's critical infrastructure at risk. As a result, our military must be ready to defend the nation and to do so at network speed. We're doing everything we can inside the military to be ready to operate in cyberspace. I call on our elected officials and the private sector to match that urgency. Together, we must place this nation on surer footing against the cyber threat. I thank you for giving me the opportunity to address you today, and I look forward to your questions. on drones. We'll just focus on cyber. Um, you described very well the immense growth of both threats, but also in turn our organizational response to them and personnel and in budget uh, new organizations. A more fundamental question I wanted to pose is it, given uh, the amount of change that's going on, is this a realm where scale matters and how do we determine that? Another way of putting it is, if we increase our budget by 300%, do we get 300% more of the capability? Or do we get 3,000% more of the capability? Or actually, do we just get 30% more of the capability? And this is, of course, a fundamental question in these, these more austere budget times. How do we look at this question of scale? Yeah, it's a good question. Is this on? Can you all hear me? Okay. Oh, we will, I will ask it again, and we'll try these ones. Okay. You've got one right behind you there. I do. Yeah. It's redundant communications. <laughs> Testing. Okay, there. Mine's on. The, the original one is on now. Did you, you all hear the question? Yeah. Okay. So. Did you hear the answer? It was really good. <laughs> um, it's, it, that's a great question. So, we ha and we haven't had to confront it. Uh, to this point because, you know, from where we started, there was no doubt we needed to, uh, to do much more. But let me give you, uh, if I could, an analogy that might be helpful to you in, in understanding our approach, the military's approach to cyber. Um, post 9-11, uh, we realized that our nation's airspace was vulnerable to terrorist attack. And so we have this uh, process called Operation Noble Eagle that I think many people are familiar with. And it's whole of government. We have a playbook, and we have forces allocated to the mission. And, and, it, and it's a public-private uh, uh, partnership. And here's how it works. The airlines harden the cockpit doors. Uh, the transportation, uh, the TSA, uh, manages the flow of passengers onto the aircraft, and as well as putting air marshals in place on selected aircraft. The FAA tracks the aircraft through its flight, and if it deems that there's a problem, they contact us, and uh, we go into a national threat conference very quickly, and essentially we pass authorities from agency to agency to agency, and if it became necessary to interdict the aircraft, that's where we come in in defending the nation. When we started that process, to your point about resources, we over-resourced it initially. We had F-16 squadrons that alert all over the country uh, in a way that was fundamentally unsustainable. And now, we're able to, with, with the experience of 10 years behind us, we're able to manage the level of resources consistent with the threat and uh, in a way that's sustainable. And I, I suggest to you that that's where we will eventually find ourselves in cyber, where we have a whole of government uh, approach, a playbook to define the roles and responsibilities. We have that, by the way. And then the resources will, will ebb and flow based on the way we see the threat evolving. As a follow-up to that, how do you go about foresizing in, in the here and now? So you know, as an example, um, why 13 cybercom teams to defend the nation 
why not 12, why not 14, why not 50? Uh, how do we go about thinking about that, and, and especially given your role also to steward the broader budget, where the more we do, then it means we probably have to give up something else in terms of an actual sure. you know, physical, be it a ship, a plane, personnel mm-hmm. moving, not working on that. How do you think about foresizing? Not unlike we think about it in the traditional domains of air, sea, and uh, air land, and sea, uh, meaning we have a pretty clear picture of the threat. And the threat is, in some cases, uh, nation states, in some cases, non-state actors, and in some cases, just this issue of broader hacktivists across the globe. And based on the threat that we understand today, uh, we have sized uh, these response teams, those at the national level, those with the, at the regional level, against that particular threat. As the threat evolves, and will evolve. But we, I think that where we are today is where we need to be based on the threat we know today. But this will take constant review and revision as, as time goes on. Mm-hmm. wanted to shift the conversation to organization. I know you've spoken on Capitol Hill about the question of the next evolution of cyber command. Uh, you were asked there about, you know, should it be unifying command, combatant command. Right. Uh, recently, Deputy Secretary uh, Ash Carter talked about how he could visualize it one day becoming its own service. But the way that it's been talked about by senior officials is we're not there yet with some of the phrasings or um, we need to focus on the threat now was, for example, how Secretary Carter talked about it. The issue that comes out of that is, as you noted, the threat's not going away. It's only going to continue to grow. So rather than putting you on the spot by asking you, you know, whether you think we should or should not have this shift, the question is more, what would be the kind of indicators that would get us to that point of thinking about it? That is, what would, what changes for us to have that kind of discussion? Mm. I think we're there now, and, and we're having that conversation. Uh, as you know, the, the, uh, it, at this point, Cybercom is a subunified command that resides under Stratcom, Strategic Command. And it, but the commander of Cybercom is dual-hatted as the director of the National Security Agency. I'm actually content the way we're organized right now. Um, you ask me what would change. I think it would be if I perceived that for some reason the span of control of strategic command became uh, unmanageable. If if cyber became such a dominant factor Mm -hmm. in military operations that it it warranted elevating it to a unified command, which, by the way, I I anticipate that'll happen um, at some point. But at this point, STRATCOM, with its global reach responsibilities as well as its space responsibilities, is also able to manage the workload that comes with being um, the, the next senior headquarters to Cybercom. Unless I saw that uh, change, I would probably be content uh, to keep it the way we have it. But I think that'll happen at some point. Mm-hmm. Is it something that, you know, you talked about the difference between uh, network speed and swivel chair yeah. speed. Could that change take place at that amount of speed and compare that to the you know, organizational change speed. Yeah, that's a great point. I, I do think that if we get the kind of information sharing that we need, and you know, as you know, the legislation this year is focused exclusively on information sharing, which I think is actually the proper path. If we get the kind of information sharing we need, that could be a catalyst for change in the organization because the, the span and scope of responsibility would change. Mm-hmm. One last question, uh, and it's Maybe a, it's a large theoretic question. It's a question in the field of everything from law, but also it's a fundamental question for your own role. As we talked about, the, the terms in this space are both new, but they're, they're very fuzzy. Mm-hmm. So to you, when would a cyber war start, and how would you know? You know, I just finished reading World War Z, so I'm kind of attuned to... <laughs> figuring out when something becomes, reaches that level. I, I actually did just finish reading World War Z. By Somewhere way. Brad Pitt is sad that you didn't see the movie. I haven't seen the movie yet. I always try, if there's a book, I go to the book and then I, with a certain amount of hubris, go to the movie and criticize it. But, um, <laughs> um, you know, that is a conversation uh, that 
we have had, but only fleetingly. That is to say, what, what changes from cyber theft? When does cyber theft become a hostile act? Or when does cyber theft added to distributed denial of services become a hostile act? Or, or is a hostile act simply defined as something that literally is destructive in nature? And frankly, that's not a conversation that, that, that will be driven by me. I think that the decision to declare something a hostile act and an act of war is certainly one that resides in the responsibility of, of our elected leaders with my advice. But to your point about a cyber war, um, I, I do think that there are capabilities out there that are so destructive in nature and potential that they would, it would be very difficult not to see them as acts of war. We haven't experienced one, but I know the capabilities out there. So for you, in many ways, it's the another way of uh, saying is the impact. I think, Steve, I, I think so, which is not unlike uh, how we would describe war in the other domains. The, the one thing I do want to point out is that Cyber is not a mystery domain, um, although sometimes it can feel abstract. I mean, it is a physical domain in the sense that, it's, that it is operated by men and women over routers and servers. And um, so there is a physical nature to it. it as you know, it's, it's difficult to track because it can move at network speed and, and, uh, and, and servers can be uh, taken and used for... Uh, for destructive purposes or for intrusion, um, even unwitting to the people who own them. And so it, it is difficult to track in that regard, but it's not abstract. And I think to the extent we can th always think about it in, in the sense of the way we've always organized our thinking about the other domains, it might illuminate the challenge a little better. Great. Well, let's open it up to the audience here. If you could uh, raise your hand and when, wait for the mic to come to you and stand and identify yourself. And finally, all questions end with a question mark. So uh, <laughs> let's, um, uh, right here in the front, I I Ian Wallace. The professor. Hi, Ian Wallace from um, Brookings 21 CSI, where I cover cybersecurity. Um, and thank you very much for your comments. Um, I wanted to look at the international context. And for reasons that you've explained, um, it is very clear that DOD has a, a real incentive to build military cyber capability, both offensive and, and defensive as, as the force operates around the world and, and to encourage allies to do the same. Um, but at the same time, you um, leave yourself open to the accusation that you're militarizing cyberspace, which makes life difficult for, for US companies and other companies. Mm -hmm. uh, I wonder if you could talk to how DOD is managing that apparent presentational challenge. Yeah, well, I mean, you know, uh, if this, if I were uh, sending a Twitter message back to you, I'd say, we have a Navy, but we're not being accused of militarizing the ocean. And that's why I say that I think the more we can think about cyber, demystify cyber, and, and think about it in terms that have stood the test of time. We have a Navy to protect the global commons and ensure the free movement of goods and services uh, in the maritime domain. And that's what we aspire to in cyber as well, by the way. Now, to your point about the international aspect of this, I, I have uh, periodic strategic dialogues with especially our closest allies. So just yesterday, we had a conversation with our Canadian counterparts and uh, over at National Defense University for about uh, three quarters of a day. And one of the topics was cyber. And you know, there was some question about why we should have a common view of the threat in cyber and potentially share some common uh, movement forward. And it's, it goes back to what I said to Peter about what could happen in cyber. Inside the United States, um, you're all familiar with the term botnets, inside the United States, we could have one sector of our, of our society, the financial sector, um, an external actor with malware could gain control of it and attack another sector of the United States economy. We could have our own financial system attacking critical infrastructure. That's not out, it's not outrageous to suggest that that same thing could happen cross borders. In fact, it's probably likely that that's the way an attack would evolve, so that it'd be deniable and, and uh, difficult to trace. So we have to have, uh, we're not there, and by the way, we weren't pushing on each other. We were having a very professional conversation about the evolving threat and how uh, it is worthy of further discussion to, uh, to 
kind of steel plate ourselves against this threat in the future. Let's give um, right in the back there. How are you doing, sir? I'm uh, John Angevine, Colonel, U.S. Army, retired. Yay. Then, then, then my advice is be kind. Uh, yes, sir, absolutely. <laughs> All right. Over the past 12 years, the Joint Forces enjoyed high fidelity uh, situational awareness, like in Iraq and Afghanistan. And as the U.S. government and the military makes a strategic shift to the Africa, Indo-Asia, Pacific region, uh, we'll be challenged to preserve that high fidelity situational awareness, uh, particularly as, as we have less boots on the ground and broader geographic regions to take a look at. Uh, consider, considering that uh, vast regions and the ISR uh, may be diffused a bit, uh, what are your thoughts on how cyber capabilities can enhance disaggregated operations using a mission command philosophy that you mentioned earlier? Mm -hmm. Thank you. Well, I mean, I, I do, first of all, to your point about um, uh, the, the, the stress on resources, I mean, clearly um, the pressure under which our resources, uh, the pressure on our resources will increase. I mean, we're trying to, we're, as you well know, we're trying to uh, figure out how to absorb the the reductions under the Budget Control Act, about $487 billion over 10, and sequester adds another 500 or so on top of that. But you know, um, strategy is always uh, the art of balancing, and science, by the way, balancing ends, ways, and means. I also think of strategy in terms of context and choice. So context, uh, in, in terms of the conversation we're having here today. Cyber is, if I haven't convinced you of anything, I hope I've convinced you that cyber is becoming a more important national security issue than it has ever been, and that will likely increase over time. Therefore, that's the context. Our choice must account for that context. And so as we go forward in balancing how we employ the resources of the department, I suspect, and you, uh, you would suspect that we will, uh, we will have to reduce our reliance upon what we might describe as traditional and conventional means and, um, and advantage cyber in these budget uh, dis discussions. Uh, I think we can do it, frankly. I think, we can, I think we can figure this out. We'd certainly like a little time and certainty in order to do it, um, but I, we, we don't have any choice. We have to figure that out. Okay. Up here. Colin Clark, Breaking Defense. Good morning, sir. Um, you mentioned that uh, elected leaders are going to have to make the uh, distinction about what constitutes an act of war. Um, are you talking about uh, Congress having to actually uh, issue a declaration of war, or are you talking about revamping uh, the distinctions between Title 10 and Title 50, or all three? Well, I, I didn't, I'm not making any assertions about Title 10 and Title 50. Um, what I am suggesting is that, that it is our elected leaders, and, and notably the Congress of the United States, that generally uh, decides whether the nation is in a, under a condition of war. It's called the War Powers Act. Um, and here's why that's important. There is an assumption out there, I think, and I would like to disabuse you of it, that that a cyber attack that had destructive effects would be met by a cyber response with destructive attacks. That's not necessarily the case. I mean, again, this is why I'm so adamant that we think of cyber as a domain not unique to all others. It has many common features of other domains, that is land, sea, air, and space. And I think that what the President of the United States would insist upon, actually, is that he had the options uh, and the freedom of movement to decide what kind of response we would employ. And that's why I say I don't want to have necessarily a narrow conversation about what constitutes war in cyber, because the response could actually be in one of the traditional, uh, one of the other traditional domains. To toss a little bit of history into that, uh, Colin, the last time the U.S. Congress actually formally declared war was in spring of 1942 against Bulgaria, one of the Axis powers that we forgot to include in the Pearl Harbor Declaration. 
Um, That's why I hate sitting with history guys. <laughs> fun, fun little factoids like that. Uh, let's get uh, right here in the front. Hi, um, I'm Jimmy Zhao from St. Albans School of Public Service. From my understanding, uh, s current encryption techniques in cybersecurity infrastructure have advanced to the point where brute force techniques from outside of a system have been rendered ineffective, and thus many attacks actually rely on human error from within the, the system. And so, how does the government, or how do you, how do you, the, how do they plan on addressing this threat from within the system? Well. I wouldn't say that it's as stark as the, I wouldn't say encryption has made the, the, the blunt brute force and ignorance approach completely. We're not completely vulnerable to that. Uh, we may be in the dot .mil domain. We're certainly not that way in some of our uh, dot .com, dot .gov, and other critical infrastructure domains. Um, you, but you speak of our approach to, let's call it cyber hygiene. And that's always a big part of this. It's, it's training and it's education, uh, which is not as difficult for your generation as it comes into the military as it is for mine. Now, there's not many of me left, by the way. Uh, I'm at the other end of the, of the, of the chronological uh, demographic. But, um, you know, it's kind of our mid-grade folks who are having the most challenge understanding the importance of, hyg hy of uh, cyber. Hygiene. But there's other things we can do, too, that I, I, I do want to highlight. I, you heard me speak of a joint information enterprise. The fact that we have 5,000 networks we're trying to manage. Uh, we really need to get to uh, take advantage of thin client and cloud technology, dramatically reduce the number of systems administrators that we have managing our program, which will make it both more effective, more efficient, and safer. So. Uh, I don't know if that answered your question, but that's the answer I wanted to give you, so I hope you like it. Uh, I'm going to do a follow-up to that because yeah. it's my responsibility on the moderator here to tie it to some events. Okay. I mean, there's, you absolutely correctly, I mean, I, I applaud the, the notion of cyber hygiene. I think it's, it's the, the, the right framing for this, contrary to the kind of Cold War yeah. framing that we often use. But the notion of um, the challenge from the inside is not, some of the incidents have been from bad cyber hygiene, someone picking up a memory stick Thumb in a parking down. lot and putting yeah. it in. But some of the larger incidents True. have been insiders mm -hmm. deliberately sharing. Yeah. And um, you talked about, you know, whether it's Manning, whether it's the recent case with Snowden, um, does this move to the cloud? On one hand, as you lay out, maybe by having less people who are systems administrators, you reduce that threat of that kind of individual. On the other hand, how do you avoid the over provision of access as you move, uh, you know, as you allow more and more people, as you bundle things together? Yeah. Well, you, you, you touch on, of course, the issue du jour in terms of how, how it's not only what happened, how could it happen? And of course, uh, uh, we're taking a very close look at that as, uh, as you would expect the uh, National Security Agency to take a closer look. There are things we can do to reduce our vulnerability. But I think it's important, you know, that you, you described it as an insider attack. It is akin almost, you know, to how do you prevent insider attacks in Afghanistan? Well, the answer is you can't prevent. Uh, you can mitigate the risk. And, and what, what I would like you to take away from the conversation about this incident with Snowden, you can't stop someone from breaking the law 100% of the time. You just can't stop that from happening. You can certainly increase the scrutiny in terms of their background investigations. You can reduce the number of them. You can, you can put uh, different degrees of oversight in place. But you know, at some point, if somebody is going to break the law and commit an act of uh, treason, I don't know what he'll eventually be charged with, or espionage, uh, they, they're, they're going to be people that do that. The key for us, of course, I think systems administrators is the right place to begin to clean this up, though, because they have such ubiquitous access, and that's how he ended up doing what he did. Um, but yeah, we've got, to, we've, got to, uh, we've got to take a much harder look at this as we become more reliant upon cyber activities. Great. Let's give uh, opportunity in the, in the back there. Hi, sir. Justin Fischel with Fox News. You mentioned uh, updating um, 
the rules of engagement for cyber. Uh, what are the rules of engagement right now, and um, how are you going to update them, and is there anyone actually obeying them? Uh, and for example, do you know if the Chinese have their own rules of engagement? And then just briefly on Syria, there's um, reports today in the Wall Street Journal that weapons are now on the move uh, from secret warehouses in Jordan. Do you have any comment on weapons to Syria? Thanks. The, uh, on the issue of rules of engagement, the, the, we, we do have this playbook I described. Um, is a playbook that describes roles and responsibilities, whether it's Homeland Security, FBI, um, Department of Defense, and how those roles and responsibilities are shared, and the authorities are shared. And by the way, the authorities are shared uh, that, and this actually makes us stronger because we have multiple lines of oversight, whether they be executive oversight, judicial, or legislative oversight, because we're sharing authorities. Um, the standing rules of engagement are uh, currently in draft. They have not yet been approved. We've, we've run several excursions and exercises. But fundamentally, I, I mean, I'll just give you a vignette, um, if you'd like. Um, if if uh, part of our critical infrastructure were under attack from a botnet, uh, let's, let's say located external to the United States, um, our first line of defense would be, first of all, to, to know about it. And we would either know about it because we saw it coming or because uh, we have this information sharing agreement when we could be told that a particular part of the, of the critical infrastructure was under attack. Our first instinct will be to pull up the drawbridge and uh, prevent the attack, that is to say block or defend. If that was unsuccessful, then the playbook might call for us to, in the Act of active defense, if you will, proportionally to go out and disable the botnet, the particular botnet that was attacking us, active defense. And then if it, becomes some, if it became something more widespread and we needed to do something beyond that, it would uh, require interagency consultation and authorities at a higher level in order to do it. But the, the, the thing you need to take away, I'm not going to tell you more than that because these are classified standing rules of engagement and they're also pre-decisional, but that's what we need is we need these, the, this playbook of roles and responsibilities and we have it. We need this standing rules of engagement and we are close. And then we need uh, the ability to, to understand what's going on, uh, which will be greatly enabled by this information sharing process. And no, I won't comment on uh, Syria. <laughs> You thought I forgot, didn't you? Right here on the front. Thank you, General, for doing this. Um, Bing Wu Wang with Hong Kong Phoenix TV. Uh, two quick questions. First, is it true the U.S. hack into chi computers in China? Secondly, um, the Chinese Foreign Ministry already asked the U.S. to give an explanation on the Edward Snowden's um, allegation. Do you think the leaks actually deprived the U.S moral high ground when you are blaming China for its attack on the U.S. Thank you. The activities that nations conduct in the intelligence arena uh, have some pretty clear standards. I mean, for example, to move away from cyber, you know, we run strategic reconnaissance flights outside of Chinese territorial waters, for example, in order to gain some insights uh, uh, to your intention, not yours, but to Chinese intentions as they develop a military. And I, you know, all countries on the face of the planet conduct intelligence activities. China's particular niche in cyber has been theft and, esp and, uh, and intellectual property. And I've had some conversations about that with them. And the conversations generally, uh, you know, we, we tend to agree to disagree. Their view is that there are no rules of the road in cyber. There's nothing, there's no laws that they're breaking. There's no standards of behavior. And so we have asked them to meet with us and the first meeting will be next week in order to establish some rules of the road so that we don't have these uh, friction points in our relationship. Uh, but intelligence activities are a separate matter and I won't comment on them except to say that all nations on the face of the planet always conduct intelligence operations uh, in all domains, and uh, we're no different, they're no different. It's not, that's not what we're talking about. We're talking about other activities in cyber that I think bear additional scrutiny. 
General, you're on Twitter. I'm on Twitter. I'm betting many of the people in this room are on Twitter. And so uh, a very appropriate to the topic, what I'd like to do in the next five minutes is take questions actually from the world of Twitter. Uh, this is the lightning this round. This is the lightning round. Okay. Um, and so please give your answers. You don't, they don't necessarily have to be 140, 140 characters, characters, but feel free right. to, to blast through them very quickly. Um, one question is, uh, and this is from uh, Casey Erdem, um, how will DOD manage key software and security updates? like issues with the F-35, UAS, and slow acquisitions process. It is another way of putting it is, um, this all moves at network speed, but we buy at glacial speed. How do we, how do, we do with no, that? No, fair program and a fair question, great question. Uh, as I said, it's, we gotta go to thin client, cloud, joint information enterprise, and we've gotta get our defense industrial base into it, and we've got to uh, put some teeth into what we call cleared defense contractors. Right. Uh, this is from the Eric McCann. What can private sector do to help the government with learning more about and defending against cyber attacks? Information sharing. We, right now, information sharing is actually disincentivized, and we need to incentivize it. Okay. Let me ask a follow-up to that that linked to a prior topic you mentioned. Uh, private security, we've got its maybe growing equivalent in the cyber realm and the um, hack back companies that are you know, right now, as I was talking with someone, if you want a couple million dollars in venture capital, say you're exploring offensive cyber, what's, what, do you, what is your view of this growing potential industry of companies that do hack back? I'm very concerned about that. In fact, it's, I have raised it as all the more reason for us to uh, come together as a whole of government because we don't want private cyber organizations conducting operations that could be perceived as hostile acts, and if they're perceived as hostile acts, it could lead us into conflict. Right. Uh, this is from uh, DRC Mackey. What would the U.S. military's role be if there was a Saudi Aramco-like attack on a U.S. company? Well, as I said, we've, we've got a, a playbook that would allow us to uh, share the authorities that are extant in uh, Department of Homeland Security, and notably FBI. And we would come together, and at the point where it exceeded their capabilities, then we would be asked to block, or potentially, uh, if blocking was ineffective, potentially some active defense measure. Mm -hmm. This is from uh, Jazz42. Where does the authority for cyber fires need to exist? Can tactical commands employ or only request strategic? What is tactical cyber? Well, tactical cyber is exclusively um, intelligence gathering and defensive in nature. There is no decentralized cyber attack authority. To the point uh, on where should cyber fires authority reside, like the Operation Noble Eagle uh, analogy I gave you, those should reside at the highest levels of government. Mm -hmm. uh, finally, this is from Jazz Easterly. Uh, why is cyber often analogized to nukes? Discrete, nuanced, non-lethal effects available with precision. Why constrain it by bad paradigms? Well, I, I, by the way, I, there are some imprecise and potentially unhelpful paradigms, but I, I think it's, it's uh, back to the, the uh, point I made early on, which is we have to demystify cyber, make it less abstract, make it more understandable. But make no mistake about it. I mean, a, if, the, if the electrical grid on the eastern seaboard were, um, I mean, look, my wife gets mad if she loses network coverage for 15 minutes. I mean, really, we're, we're tra and by the way, this is traveling around the world. So, it's, and it's not just an inconvenience. There, if, if we lost critical infrastructure on the east coast for a period of time, people's lives would be lost. And that's indiscriminate. And that's why I think sometimes the nuclear analogy comes into play, not in terms of its, of its scale, but maybe in terms of its indiscriminate effect. Mm -hmm. It's a great point to, to end on, if um, you'll allow me to ask one final question, which is, as you've talked about, there's a, a huge need to demystify. And in many ways, the, the role that you and other senior government leaders are playing is part of this, trying to demystify it to the public, but particularly also warn the public of the challenges that are out there and call for the need to undertake various actions. Um, but 
how do you balance that with the risk of unintentionally aiding the impact? That is, there is, um, in deterrence theory, there's deterrence by denial, that, that I'm less likely to attack you if the attack's not going to work. Um, in the computer security world, there's the magic word of resilience, the idea not only to fail gracefully, but also to bounce back quickly. Um, and yet, you know, you use this example of the ultimate nightmare scenario of the power grid going down. I will bet my month's salary that the power grid will go down in Maryland this summer. Yeah. But if I add cyber to it, will have the comparison to a 9-11. And I bet we'll, have a, we'll see a lot of responses in Congress. And so uh, another way of putting it is, how do we balance between warning of the threat, but also the, you know, filling the old British poster of keep calm and carry on? Right. Well, based on where, you know, I think we were, we were in the keep calm and carry on for about the last, I don't know, five years or so. And we were carrying on, but we were, late to need and inadequate to the task. So if you sense a renewed emphasis uh, and effort, it's because, as I said, since I became the chairman, two years, not even two years ago, the number of intrusions into our critical infrastructure have increased 17-fold. So keep calm and carry on, I think, is not uh, appropriate to the threat. And I think we have to, even at risk of, in some ways, by demystifying it, maybe reducing its deterrent value, I think we have to have that conversation with America about the, the potential impacts. Mm -hmm. General, thank you very much. This has been an incredibly rich discussion. This has certainly been by far the best discussion I've been involved in with a leader on cybersecurity, so very much appreciated. And I can see people in the audience nodding their heads, so thank please you. join me in a round of applause. Yeah.